What will we do with the drunken sailor? What will we do with the drunken sailor? What will we do with the drunken sailor early in the morning? Well, welcome back to Mages and Sages, interview with the old mage with our special guest, Jeff Grubb. This is part two of this interview. Do hope you enjoy. We'll lead off, coming off of that cliffhanger from Eric Blade. I hope you enjoy. Belly with a rusty razor early in the morning. Way, hey, and up she rises. Way, hey, and up she rises. Way, hey, and up she rises early in the morning. So what I will say, and I mean this as a, as a true compliment, so I think I've probably read <laughs> Mass Scourge more closely than probably anybody but the people who wrote it. Wow. Because... Maybe more closely than I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But let me get to the compliment part. Because I was writing up the city of Westgate right. for a Cloak and Dagger web supplement. So I had to go through, like, page by page, mm-hmm. pulling out, like, partial sentences to, like, yep. give me little clues. And yep. I swear, I didn't find a single thing that was inconsistent in that whole book. In addition <laughs> to being a great novel, it yes. was so tight. It was tightly put together. We had an idea of where... Now, other people have written in Westgate, as you encountered as well, and so you yep. have to incorporate all the other pieces as well. But we had we knew very tightly what we wanted to do with those characters. Eric, yeah, you almost sound it, disappointed. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. It was, like, so much fun, but, like... I found Realm's Lore little tidbits on almost every page, mm-hmm. and they all held together, and it just really showed how much love you put into the book. It was really <laughs> one of my favorites. Another thing you'll find in the novels I've written on work, uh, work with people, game product, is I put a lot of hooks in, and I don't necessarily answer everything. I will basically play fair with the reader, so by the time you get to the end, you feel like the big questions were answered, and I gave you... Uh, sufficient clues as to who the character was and you know, what the big reveal is coming, etc. So when they see it, they can say, oh, I understand this now. <laughs> but I also leave a lot of hooks for people who are going to follow up. They say, well, what about this? What about this future? What about that? What happened to this character? You know? And that's fine. And that works very well for me because, you know, as working on game product, we would leave hooks and then people might pick them up or they might leave them aside. So. Well, it's a very actually, cool book. Absolutely. I do have to throw one in here from Stephen Chin. Okay. And, um, he did He did ask a question on one of the sites when I put up a... Let everybody okay. know that you, you're going to be here. He wants to know, where if, if, can you share uh, a recipe for instant pot cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that on the Facebook, and I was going to tell people about it uh, there, because, you know, often it's a case where if someone makes, you know, makes an in-reference, and, you know, everybody laughs, and then one person says, go... What's going on? <laughs> what does that mean, right? <laughs> in the Forgotten Realms comic book, uh, we had Fox <laughs> along Cardluck, who was uh, first mate on the flying ship, uh, the Realms Master. We did a story in which uh, he had a bad trip because uh, halflings are affected by a partic- by cheese. Or cheese with about <laughs> I so. and he, write it he wrote it with several e's. You noticed yes. that, right? Okay. Yes. The, the name of the name of the story was called Head Cheese, and it was a done in one, and it yeah. was very much. And what oddly enough, and the, the artist here was Rags Morales, who has since done all sorts of wonderful things. Forgotten Realms was like his first big book, you know. What, but one of the reasons is for Head Cheese was. They were concerned about, you know, basically it takes a comic book story is 24 pages long at that point. An artist working at a good rate does a page a day. That provides no space whatsoever over a course for a monthly comic book to get. And this is why you often see other you know, fill-in artists or you see right. uh, stories, etc. We've done that type of trick as well. But back in the day, the idea is, okay, how do we get ahead of the game? I know we will put said that this story primarily in Fox Along's mind. Okay? Therefore, we have black backgrounds. We're fine. We don't have to, you know, don't have to worry about it. And basically, it'd be easier to do. But Rags did such a great job with it. You know, he was doing all sorts of detail, all sorts of backgrounds, and he was even more detailed than we originally intended. So, so you know, that was another challenge that we had to, had to deal with. Uh, going forward but I really that story really means a lot to me because I would write it and I would you know turn it over to DC for approval and they would send it to my boss Jim Ward 
to take this is the script and of course there's the advantage there that you know he already knows what i'm going to put up there so you know it's, it's not like he's getting any surprises so he gets sorry and he liked it so much that when the pencils came in he put them all on his wall outside Really? That they, yes, he liked that story so much that he basically laid out the story so everybody <laughs> could read it before we before it went to press. So that that just you know that that delighted me to no end. So. Oh, that's incredible! And actually, there's a follow-up question sure. um, by Thiago Sequeira, mm-hmm. and he wants to know what was your collaboration like with Rax Morales? It was fantastic. As I said, this was one of his first. Uh, big comic books. Uh, we were very fortunate to get him, uh, but he was he was breaking in as well. So he was really pushing as far as you know all, all the buttons. How can we present this? How can we story tell? And much as again with the novels, I would work with a relative a tight outline. I would give the uh, it works Marvel style, which is to say, the writer writes stuff, the artist draws it, the writer figures out how to put all the words balloons in. And right. I would basically lay out, okay, here's the page layout I'm envisioning. And he didn't always use it. But, you know, when he did go straight, he made it better. Okay? When he right. did basically change things up, he said, you know, I didn't have to worry about, you know, like this suddenly not uh, not fitting anymore or not foreshadowing what we need to do. He had a very, he was very hands-on. His characters are wonderful and distinctive and iconic and I really, it was really, really a joy working with them. And I, I really, we, we still are in quasi touch. We sort of like yeah. say hi on every so often. I really liked working with him. He was, he it, was, he was great. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds like you almost enjoyed doing the comics more than the novels. I enjoy both. They're different parts of my brains. Right, um, right. The novels, particularly the ones that I work on alone, are very lonely. And even when you are working in collaboration with someone, with Ed or with Kate, it's the fact that, you know, basically you finish it and then turn it over type of thing. Uh, working on a comic book story has much more of a graphic capacity, has a lot. And I've done several comics off and on since then, working with the artist, finding out where their strengths are and just, you know, coming back and forth. And the comics can be, well, a little more comic as well. I'm a little right. broader when I'm basically uh, writing comics than I am necessarily writing novels, though I've got some very broad novels and very comic sequences in the, in the novels as well. The books themselves, it just was re- the comic books. It was just you know the the ability to work with you know very talented people and see the words come alive. This is very one of the great things uh, is with uh, the novels, the game product, comic books, very fast turnaround. So you know the reward cycle is very. I, I finished this and then six months later here it is right in front of you. So it's so it's very it's a very different type of uh, relationship than to say computer games where basically we are a consensus driven we are basically taking things all times and you're knitting a whole bunch of different idea a different you know ta- a tapestry that's alive at the same time and everybody's working on stuff at once and it's very, it's really interesting but sometimes you're not going to get necessarily everything you want so it's a very different part of your brain that you're working on when you're doing computer games than right. comic books than, uh, than novels than games so. It just seems like your 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 persona kind of lightened up more when you talked about the comics. That's the reason I asked. The comic um, books have a warm spot in my heart. Yeah, yeah. and it's not, not just the ones with DC. You know, I've I've done we we did a couple. Oh gosh, who, who was the one we did the uh, Mage Fair comic with? Oh, uh, Devils Do. Devils Do. Yes, Elminster at the Mage Fair, two part comic, and it was an adaptation of one of Ed's stories. I know okay. the one you're talking about. <laughs> and, the thing is, and the thing is, because it was a two-part story, we had to end on a high note for the story, and then start then start again for the next next for the resolution. And unfortunately, there was no no like easy break point. So right. I, I wrote in an attempt on Elminster's life, and I, I cleared it with Ed. I, I put it in, and one of the comments I got from uh, from Watsi at the time was, uh, "How how dare you change Ed's you know story?" <laughs> 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 and I wrote back. And I said, "I uh, I actually okayed this with Ed, you know, basically because I wanted to make sure we remained true to his thing." And I got an email back saying. How dare you go behind our back and talk to Ed? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
what? One of our assets talks to another one of our assets? They're not allowed out of their boxes. <laughs> Communications has always been a big challenge because Ed was in uh, Canada. And this was at a time before the internet, when we finally got the internet uh, hooked up. It was hooked up to one machine in Bruce <laughs> Nesbitt's office. We communicated by Federal Express, by package delivery. So, but making sure that, you know, I would spend about, I guess, once a week, maybe twice on the phone with Ed, long distance, yep. uh, making sure we kept the, kept, you know, put the phone bill on TSR's tab. And just bring him up to date where everything is, because, you know, it's the idea of trying to keep the communication open as far as, you know, making sure people are aware what we're up to, because often things would slip through. So. Right, right. And, uh, and it was sometimes hilarious, because I would answer the phone if I wasn't at home, I was at work. Yes, yes you would. <laughs> at a public library, which was a one-room 1960s open concept public library. Mm-hmm with a centrally located uh, circulation desk and the phone would ring and I would pick it up and say good afternoon Bookbanks Library and it would be Jeff or somebody (laughs) else at TSR like book department whoever and they'd say so we want to kill a god (laughs) how do you disembowel a god (laughs) and I'm in a quiet public library and I'm saying well uh, actually you know (laughs) first of all I, I soon learned you don't use the speakerphone function Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and the second thing is, it is hilarious to see how many D and D fans drift out of the science fiction <laughs> and fantasy section when they hear me answer the phone, and they just sort of casually stand around with books open in front of their faces when they're not reading a line and they're not turning the pages, and you're going, hmm. <laughs> Plus. Plus your co-workers, you know, I would get a hold yes. of one of them that, you know, oh, God, it's you. Okay, Ed, it's, 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 guys in the States. Ed said he knew his schedule, so you would only call when he was at work, so you yes. know. <laughs> well, again, easier, easier for communication yeah. at that point, too, so. Right, and, and talk about communication when you are saying before the internet, uh, just real uh, quick, what was it like reading um, Ed's uh, manuscripts when they came in with the little uh, tombstones? Yes, I, I, I've heard of that. <laughs> um, now these are, these, I think these, these have, have worked their way out into the greater world at this time, but when Ed sent his original packages of material to TSR, first off, he would wrap them within an inch of their life. <laughs> We're talking that he would take the manuscript and he would basically wrap it in newspaper and then he would wrap that in this thick mylar Canadian <laughs> hand wrap, you know, type this of stuff. Queen. You know, it's it, it just, <laughs> just this thick thing. They put that in, they put another paper cover, and then he put another layer of mylar on top of it. Then, you know, he would basically put in the disc at this point, which was wrapped in foil and then wrapped in mylar again. <laughs> and this would then go into the package. And it, it, it literally, you know, like my, my uh, Ann Brown and the other editors who were, you know, like, right over the cube wall for me would hear me spend 15 minutes just unwrapping a package and you know, I'm, I'm working on it and I'm cutting things and, and I hear over the cube well Ed sent another package didn't he go, yeah <laughs> well you see my job at the public library was to take the mail to the post office yes. and get the mail from the post office mm-hmm. and the post office helped with this they had these old dirty absolutely filthy canvas mail bags with uh, metal slide and and cotton cord drawstrings. They looked like something off a a sailing ship. And they would invariably throw them off the back of the truck at 20 miles an hour as they drove through the parking lot into a four inch deep puddle where they would sit overnight until we got (laughs) there for work. So I was figuring any mail I sent to TSR was gonna get the same treatment at some point during its trip through two sets of customs and two sets of post offices, uh, uh, excuse me, postal services, and mm-hmm. and would eventually arrive dripping, spoiled, peed upon by cats and dogs, torn the apart outer, by the outer bears. Layers <laughs> would, would have um, uh, the outer layers would have water stains sometimes, so the, he is yeah. absolutely correct. <laughs> wow. Now, when we did get to the and, point of advancing to 
Federal Express things in print. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, all of this happened because at a long ago Milwaukee era Gen Con in the quad at Mecca, yes. Steve Winter did a panel on how to write for TSR. And he held up a floppy disk in the days when they really were floppy and they were eight inch squares. Yes. And he waved it and he said, this was sent to us for a tournament that we're running here at Gen Con. You will note that the writer stapled it <laughs> to his manuscript. <laughs> Go I do this. this. <laughs> so that impressed itself upon my mind. So I thought, okay, I have to wrap everything. And I'm, I'm really sorry. Well, okay. I'm sorry for the time it took. I'm not sorry for the free entertainment it gave when when people like oh, Jeff, yeah. who'd had enough of this, would hand it to the newest intern or the newest guy and say, could you just uh, open this for me? I was that guy. <laughs> so, so I didn't hand that off. Until oh, was, okay. So I, we, we didn't have, you know, basically we did not make interns suffer like that. But anyway, <laughs> back to the story, though. Once this is all unwrapped, uh, Ed wrote this in the uh, his original notes in an era before cut and paste technology on computers so they, it was typewritten and then he would often cut it up and reassemble it shades of burrows and naked lunch you know basically he, he, he would basically <laughs> oh wait this idea needs to be up here so we would cut it out and he would put it up there and then he would put the rest of his manuscript and then he had something on the side as well there were no <laughs> margins on these papers and for a while his typewriter had a bad t key so he would go through afterwards and draw in all the little t's and this is where you get the little <laughs> tiny graveyard you mentioned of his manuscript and I, I don't know what happened to those. You know, I think they went, they ended up like in Julia Martin's possession. Yeah. And yeah. she uh, she sold them originally along with the, the Forgotten Realms map, which is often called the original. It's not, but it is the one that TSR used. Ed sent us the uh, map of the realms, which he had manhandled on the photocopier to basically right. get, you know, get all the pieces. It was 25 <laughs> pages, and I would basically tape it all together and hang it outside my wall. And as we redrew parts of the realms map, like adding the moon sea or draining the great ice so we could have uh, H1 Vasa and Damara. Vasa and Damara get, get shows, shows up there. So all sorts of changes basically went on to that map. And that became our core map for it. And eventually, when I left the company, Julie Martin, who was the editor in charge, had, had uh, kept that one. And then after you know pieces folded and she left, basically she kept that and a lot of other important papers with them. And I think she gave, she sold it to a collector in uh, Madison. Oh, so, really. yeah, Alex so, Kammer. Alex Kammer, thank you. So if you go to Gamehole, Game Hole. Mm -hmm. you can see it, yes. the map. Right. Yeah, and that's, uh, that makes me happy, again, knowing that it found a good home. Yeah, so she, brought right. the, she brought that to a seminar at one of the Gen Cons, didn't she? That's it's right. I'll believe that. Yeah. Yeah. We all, he also sent us Waterdeep, which was <laughs> 57 8 and a half by 11 pieces <laughs> of paper. <laughs> he had to actually hang up on the second floor landing. We had like the main floor, we had a second floor. We had to hang, the only place we could find space for it was like on this two story wall. Okay, and one of our marketing guys came in and said, "Oh my God, this is fantastic! We should turn this into a product." And that's where City System came from. Wow! It is the idea that it, it was it was we had this huge map of Waterdeep, you know, which of course shrunk down to this itty bitty teeny tiny one page uh, uh, color <laughs> uh, uh, overleaf on the first uh, FR one, and so the idea of just expanding it out was a huge you know wonderful uh, effort that our map making team did on that and so. the original map was a mm -hmm. lot more complicated than it needed to be because photocopiers in those days mm -hmm. distorted everything around oh, yes. the edges of the blink mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i was actually photocopying the same part of the city from different angles three or four times right. so that you'd get pieces of paper where all the building edges matched up and the distortion would be in the middle of an alleyway or a street so poor Jeff had a had a, an assembly guide where I'd hand drawn yep. pieces diagonally across <laughs> other pieces, taped them on like this. 
to go the, avoid um, the distortion. <laughs> and, and also because because it was a handwritten map. Have you heard the uh, story of Kavanaugh? No. Huh? So I have. Uh, I yeah, well, you've heard else. more than enough of these stories, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, you're sick of, sick of it by now. Um, no, no, it's so, fun. South of Waterdeep, there was like a dungeon entrance, and it was labeled Kavanaugh. And I was doing, I did all the map tags, so basically I ended up, okay, what's that one? Okay, that's Kavanaugh. And someone else saw it later in the design process and said, well, it's like there's basically, it leads into a large cavern complex that's got, uh, basically was an ancient empire, and now we have the lost empire of Kavanaugh. And people have written all these stories, all this you know, background material. It actually is Cave Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I could not read his handwriting. <laughs> so. No. And that's... In my defense, I sent no type, typed mm-hmm. map tags <laughs> for all these things. Because yeah. I know my handwriting was crap. Yes, oh, and, and basically all, yes, and all, he had all sorts of, in the original uh, maps that we, he provided, he had all sorts of bordellos, oh, and yes. brothels, <laughs> and sor- the occasional seraglio. <laughs> so, and uh, basically, I had the choice between either finding a new name for all of these, or ch- removing every map tag and then changing the numbering accordingly. <laughs> and that's where Fest Halls came from. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I thought everybody knew that story. Yeah. And I actually saw something the other day. Somebody posted and then we had posted about, you know, the Fest Halls. You know, those are really bordellos and, and whorehouses. Originally. Originally, right. And they're like, really? <laughs> I'm like, yes, they were. They had no <laughs> idea that they were they're, they're, all their characters were meeting in a bordello or something so. <laughs> oh the young well, these days <laughs> when we did we renamed them we broadened the number of sins gluttony is therefore a part of it so it's a place with <laughs> so think of it as a resort a spa basically they, uh, in addition to everything else a uh, gaudy variety house from the 1890s so <laughs> <laughs> which actually well, fits because mm-hmm. a british music hall yes you know uh you had people do who were stand-up comedians mm-hmm. you had magicians who yes. did card tricks yes. and made coins come popping them out of your mouth you had people walking around selling you food and then you had ladies taking their clothes off up on stage yes. but i mean there were other things and you could rent private booths not just to gamble in and mm-hmm. not just for sexual purposes but businessmen used them when they wanted to meet away from associates right to make another business deal with somebody else. It was neutral ground. Plus D and D groups, you know, it's just Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a Thank uh, you. Thank you. Yes. There was a uh, uh, what a, what a year, years later there was a Simpson as episode where you know Bart ends up working at a variety house, that type of thing. And at the end right. of course it gets stripped down and two of the old guys say, Good thing they don't know about the brothel. So <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna have shirts made up for Gen Con for that, but I thought I better, I better not one year. So <laughs> next year, next, next year. year, next yeah. year. That's right. Sounds next year good. in Gen Con. That's right. That's right. Uh, okay, so I got one here. Uh, that was a great spinoff in there. Thank you for, yeah. for all, all that. I, I, I've got you know, the, I've, I've told these stories way too many times. As I've been <laughs> well, they're enjoyable. I've heard, I've heard some of this from Ed too, but yeah. It's, and that's the great thing is talking to the old guys is we'll give you slightly different spins. So <laughs> no, exactly, yeah. and I've heard the story about the about the the, the nuclear war wrapped package that you would yeah. get. You know, <laughs> uh, that's what it was like on the receptive side. <laughs> right, and he was on the the giver. You're the receiver. Yeah. All right, this is actually from Alexander Mitchell Korari, and he's uh, he wants to know where did you acquire most of your information for the nine hells. And he wants to know was it was it Dante's Inferno inspired? That's that's not a question for me. That's actually Ed, I think, oh, because the because when I did the um, the answer is Dante's Inferno, but I believe Ed did a and I think we credited accordingly a very good Dragon Magazine article. One of the things we did uh, when we did Manual of the Planes is mm-hmm. I referred to it in the introduction as Fibber McGee's Closet, which now 
<laughs> loses even more people than yeah. it did back yeah. in the day, right. which was a radio show in which a bit was, you know, someone had to go look in the closet, and the closet would, well, everything in the closet would tumble out. Right. And what we had in the planar areas was we had a lot of material that people added over the years that basically said, and this is how it works, and trying to figure out how it all functioned together and to build it a whole coherent universe. I did not, you know, I did not create the Great Wheel. Sometimes I'm credited for it, and that's untrue. I think Steve Marsh, I want to say, is the one behind the original one, which was a square at the time in Dragon Magazine. Right. And it went through uh, Legends, uh, Deities and Demigods, Legends and Lore, which basically became the wheel and it had the concord and opposition at its center i basically said yes it's got the center it's got this ever you know exponential slope that never reaches the top and that's right. at the very center of it because that's the wheel that's at the hub center of the hub and then uh, zeb cook came along and said yes and on top of that there's this <laughs> belt it's called sigil and I'm, I'm sigil, and I'm basically yes, and I'm well. That's a different version. Yeah, right. That's, yeah, that's, that's, different, that's different, way later. That, that's that's a way later version where they said, right. okay, we don't necessarily want to make it all a great wheel. So they were trying some different ideas, but it stuck as an idea. And I kept trying to talking with Zeb about the idea. Well, there's no top to this, and then he goes, yes, I know, and the sigil is on the top of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's no top. <laughs> there's no. You don't understand. There is no top. Yeah, um, I, I liked I liked the Great Wheel myself. I thought it was uh, it, it was, it was, was a very design. effective. It did well. It did well as far as alignment was concerned. It gave you a great idea of what was going on there. I think it was a really sharp one. But I, I did not create it. I was actually a fan when I first saw that. So one of the things with manual planes was now one thing I did do, and this is actually on the short list of things I am incredibly proud of. There we go. Things I'm incredibly proud of is how is it that you have infinite planes of hell but you seem to be descending. And what I did, and this was very simple, was when you come into a plane, a level, a layer of hell, you're always at the highest point. And when you leave the bottom valley, that's always at the, at the lowest point that leads to the next layer. So you're always descending as you're going through the layers. So this is how, why, how we create the illusion, the appearance that these infinite planes have a top and a bottom because where you, your exits are always down at the bottom and your entrances to upper planes are always at the top. So you have to always go down. And you see, this is where Jeff is brilliant. He's an engineer. That's true. So he works out <laughs> how things work, and he did it for Spelljammer, too. Mm -hmm. If each little ship in the phlogiston is generating its own gravity field, and the sentry, who's not supposed to be smoking, sees yes. his boss coming and flings the cigarette to the right. It will circle the ship and come back come to back him. around, right? Yes. And, and <laughs> Jeff worked out all this stuff. <laughs> and he I, I worked out all the stuff with the planes too, and it was brilliant having these conversations all over the phone. And while I'm standing in the public library, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sitting in this room full of books. And here's somebody actually putting all these ideas to use. <laughs> this guy knows how yes. they bolt together. And then, and then I thought of that old George Carlin line. Oh. If you bolt two things together in this country, some schmuck will buy it from you. And I'm Not thinking, that. that's Jeff, yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I use that line. You know, if you put yeah. two things together that no one's put together before, some schmuck will buy it. <laughs> but the thing is, it's actually for Manual of the Planes, uh, for all those planar arrangements and, you know, the twin paradises facing each other. I took right. uh, six by nine cards and basically took out all my old engineering drafting tools and basically drew everything up on those sheets. And so those basically, and I, I uh, a couple of years ago, someone expressed an interest. So I sent them a copy of the turnover draft of Bangalore the Plains along with those cards. And you basically, you know, I got it out of my house. I feel happy about it. And I ran into the guy at North Texas afterwards. And he just was really, really happy about having those because that was a piece of history. Now, one of the things I talked about, I said, we have a draft copy. In those days, TSR, its printer, was dot matrix, mm -hmm. and it basically had the line numbers along the side. 
So basically, the whole, every time you printed a new document, it would start at 0, 01, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way down. So that was a part, and they had – it was a feed as opposed to a right. individual sheets. So you had the side you know, pieces where it goes through the little uh, nubbins that uh, basically to, to feed the uh, paper through. So it just – you need to print it, and then you need to tear it all apart and keep it in order, in order and then put, put punch holes in it mm-hmm. to put it into a ring binder for turnover. So – yeah, so yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about there. And when I visited TSR, they, they would <laughs> they would they would stick me in the Mac room. Yes, which is where they printed everything. The diskette got fed into the, and the poor Mac had a had a box of fan fold paper on the floor underneath mm-hmm. it, and a continuous feed. And everybody would come in and reach over your head, and say, "Oh, that's not my job." And yes. then walk away again. And then the next person would come in and rip, rip, and take it away. And the and the editrixes in book department could take my manuscripts and read them on their laps in their cubes, and they get to my sex scene and just tear it off just at the perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Back at TSR at that point, there were two Macintoshes, and because when we got off the H, well, originally we had when I was working there, we had an HP. For, okay, first projects I worked on were on a typewriter. We got on to, into the new building, and we had it all on the HP with a program called TextEdit, and that was what we wrote everything on. Then we went to PCs, and they came. They asked everybody what you want, and since I had a Mac at home, I said I'd prefer to have a Mac, so I was one of the only Mac users on that floor. We also used a Mac for scheduling because PCs could not handle PageMaker at that point, but the Macs could because they had the, the interface for it. And since I understood Macs, I was the person who would sit there with Jim Ward arranging <laughs> our schedule <laughs> for the next year, you know, wow. pushing things. Okay, we can't have three box sets in March. Okay, where can we move it? You know, and, and basically, so we're doing this Tetris scheduling, trying to figure out what our next year looks like ad hoc in front of this uh, Mac as, we, as it goes forward. So. Well, we do hope you enjoyed part two of our interview with the old mage featuring Jeff Grubb. Part three will be coming up in about a week. Until then, keep playing in the realms. Hail and well met, or should I say, male wet. I know you're listening. I want you to know that I want you to keep listening. Are you all alone with no one to talk to? Then I think you know what to do. You want to reach out and touch that keyboard and join in all the raucous fun and naughty revelry. Come and listen to the rousing discussions of fiery balls, succulent succubae, and dominating demonesses. Let us tantalize you with tales of hardened warriors, whipped peasants, and of course, everyone's favorites, giggling and tickling gnome folk. Be a good little fan and tell your friends. Bug your co-workers. Write a letter to your local politician. Let's be sure to encourage all those little would-be fans of the realms out there to subscribe to the Mages and Sages podcast and do indeed put that thumbs up and like the episode and of course ring my bell for all the hottest notifications you know you want to. And who am I, you ask? Why, it's me, Ed Greenwood, 
the one that's been making all your fantasies come true for decades. Let's keep a good thing going, baby. <laughs>